Hello. How are you, man? I'm good. How are you? Great photograph. Nice. Okay, good. Oh, looks like it's just sorry, I'm not on camera. Yeah, sorry, I'm not on camera. I'm here with my, my daughter trying to put her to sleep. So I, I definitely want that here. Oh, no. Yeah, to say, though. No. Perfect. Perfectly fine. No no issues. Thank, thanks for letting me know as well. Because I usually call out on people for cameras. But thanks for letting <laughs> me know in advance. Yeah, yeah. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll stick around for a couple more minutes uh, to see if uh, others are joining in. Otherwise, I'll get started. It's going to be you okay. and me. Cool. Mm. Hello, Garaf. Hola. How are you? Great. Man, you, you sing? That, that's a, that, that was a, <laughs> one of the best videos that I've ever seen. Thank you so much, Garaf. You know, we're that's trying awesome. to be different, trying to lead Jen with the singing. We're okay. Testing out the waters. I'm sure you, you, people said, forget me buying, I'll sell my place with you. <laughs> Grab, if you use me as an agent, I think I'd go to heaven. Or I'd just uh, die and go to heaven, I mean. Dad, <laughs> you, 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 you're, you're amazing. I'm sure uh, things are, how, how are things with you? They're good, they're good. Yeah. We're busy, so yeah. I can't complain. That, yeah. That's the way it should be. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Yeah. How, how are you? you? Uh, wonderful. Thank you, good. All right, so Dwight told me that uh, he has, uh, is, is, is being a very good daddy and is spending some time with the baby sleeping next to him so he can put the video on. I respect that. Uh, Ava, are you in a position to keep your camera on? How nice of you. Thank you. See? It's much better. And Kate is going to sing for us. Uh, I don't even know what you'd want me to sing. But the same song you sang yesterday at the open house. Oh, the part of your world. Well, Grav, you'll never believe it. I actually got COVID. So I was quarantining all week at my house. I got the Delta. Oh, my God. Sorry to hear that. But it's geez, okay. It was kind of like okay? a, Yeah, it was like a mild cold, but I was struggling just, you know, I mean, I had the MREA book. I had things I did, could do, but that's why I was like, I guess I'll just sing while I'm at home. That's awesome. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. awesome. It was an open house. It was your own house. Yeah, my own house. Yeah. But yeah, the quarantine's done though, so we're better. Okay, wonderful. That's for negative, yeah. All right, it's 3 or 3, so let's get started. Um, thanks. Th thank you, uh, all three of you, for uh, taking the time. And let's get started. All right, so this, this, this book that we were reading. Today we'll do the last last few chapters, and then I have a different topic that I'm going to be talking next month. But we'll get done with this uh, book today. So the topic that we're going to discuss today are commitment, finances, and relationships. Just a recap, real quick, to remind you know time passes by fast. So just a reminder of a few things we were talking in the last class. The secret of your success is determined by your daily agenda. You will never change your life until you change something you do daily. Success doesn't just suddenly occur one day in someone's life. Neither does failure. Each is a process. So, you know, have you heard the phrase that uh, you're dying so slowly that you think you're winning? The same, same concept. It's, uh, you know, people just don't realize that, uh, that, you know, just because they are stagnant, they feel that they haven't changed. But st being stagnant is basically failing or going down because the standards or the parameters are being raised for everybody else if they're working ahead of you. So staying in the same spot is actually failing. Every day of your life is merely preparation for the next. What you become is the result of what you do today. You're preparing for something every day. The question is, are you preparing for success or failure? You can pay now and play later, or you can play now and pay later. Choice is yours. Either way, you're going to pay. But you also, either way, you're going to play. So you can, you know, you can, you can, you can do that now um, or do it later. I'd rather do it now and, when, and pay now because it's easier. I'm more healthier. I'm younger. I have more motivation. Um, but as you get older uh, and then, you, you know, life has Life can happen. So uh, I don't want to be waiting for the unknown factor. I'd rather do it now when I can. All right, so let's start with commitment. 
If something is worth doing, I will commit myself to carrying it through. So that's so commitment is if I feel that there's something that needs to be done, I am going to commit to get, take it through. So motivation is what gets you started. Commitment is what keeps you going. It's very hard for people to get started. And that's why sometimes an external motivation is necessary. You know, you, uh, somebody that uh, uh, you, you, people, kids don't like going to school, so you have to have a teacher in a school. Uh, people don't like going doing workouts, so they have trainers. Uh, there's so many friends' motivation, parents' motivation. Uh, people are self-motivated as well, but that is extremely challenging. But commitment is what keeps you going. Nobody can do your job. At the end of the day, you have to do it. Count the cost. It can be very difficult to stand by a commitment naively made. The commitment becomes much stronger when you have already counted the cost. I'll give you an example. Why do people bet? With each other, friendly bet. You want to bet I can do this for 10 bucks? You want to bet I'll lose 50 pounds in X amount of time? You want to bet, bet I want to run as fast? Is because if you just say I will run very fast, that's a commitment you're making to run very fast. But that is just a naively made commitment. But when you count the cost around it, I'm going to fight for winning. I'm going to fight for money. I'm going to fight for competition. Then there's a cost involved with it. That makes the commitment much, much more stronger. People run the fastest and give their best when they're running the Olympics or the, for a gold medal. But when they're practicing, only few would give in the 110% because that's when you need a coach to push you for that and saying, go, go and push yourself at the highest possibility. Determine to pay the price. Once you count the cost, then you have to decide whether you're really willing to do what it takes to follow through. So now you know the cost. You know, what also happens sometimes is that people say, hey, do you want, do you, do you want to see who runs the fastest? And I'll bet you a buck. And the other guy will say, that buck doesn't excite me. So I'm not going to give you my best for a buck. You know, you know bet 10 bucks? Because at 10 bucks, I'll put in my commitment and I'll, and I'll show that that actually matters for our conversation. Same thing in life. Think about your business, your, your, your livelihood, your career, your family. What, when, you, when you know that, um, have you heard the phrase that go to work every day like your, last, your, your next meal is dependent on it or you got to go work every day um, as if you are going to be hired again? Uh, the concept is the same, that you have to put a cost behind it not just I'm going to go to work to make some money today. Go to work as if you need to get hired again today in the same job. Then you're going to put some, 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 some real meat behind it. Always strive for excellence. People forget how fast you did a job, but they remember how well you did it. So while you're doing it, make sure you're the best at it or you're giving your best that you can. So there might be others who might be better than you, but if, as long as you're giving you 100%, people will see that. Excellence means doing your very best in everything, in every way. It's your very best. It doesn't have to be the best ever. It's your very best. When you accomplish something that you once believed was impossible, it makes you a new person. Completely changes the mindset. It changes the way you see yourself and the world. Isn't that true? We always believe that there's, there's, not, there's some things that we cannot never achieve. And then one day when we achieve it, it's like, wow, if I could do this, I could probably take over the world. Eva, can you, give me, can you think of any own example where you accomplished something that you never thought you could? How that impacted your life? I never thought I could pass the real estate exam at the first try. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Yeah, That's but a, I passed. Yeah. The congratulations. And then once you passed it, now you're thinking, well, if I can do that, I can definitely be successful in this business as well. Because yeah. there are many people who don't pass and mm -hmm. who don't pass in their first try. So you're <laughs> way ahead of the game already. Yeah. <laughs> Expect commitment to be a struggle. Just because you committed it doesn't mean that it has to happen and come your way. 
you have to go through a struggle. Anything worth having is going to be a struggle. If it was so easy, everyone would be doing it. Don't rely on talent alone. If you want to reach your potential, you need to add strong work ethic to your talent. Right? You know, okay, you're, you're, you're a singer and you're a performer. But does it mean that you don't have to perform to maintain your talent or get better? Always have to do, right? Because if you just say, I'm a natural singer, it doesn't make you the best. You have to continue practicing and to do the same. So just because you feel I'm a natural negotiator, I'm a natural salesperson, that doesn't mean that you're script practicing for a, a question that, uh, or, or an objection that the client may ask you, you will come up on the spot. You still have to practice your scripts. You still have to practice your listing presentation. You still have to practice your negotiating skills with someone else who's not your client because you don't want to risk that $10,000 in that negotiator or in that script practicing. Focus on choices, not conditions. Focus on external or eternal. So many people, will, you know, it's focused on choices. You have a choice. Ava, you have a choice of uh, going for the exam or not going for the exam. You had a choice of uh, working and studying for it or not. Uh, either you could say, it's COVID, all the in-person classes were done, so I didn't have an opportunity of going there in person. Or you take it internally and say, I don't care what has happening outside. I will figure out a way to get all my concepts cleared and go for the exam. It's an internal versus external challenge. If you look internally, I'm going to achieve whatever I want to achieve by doing whatever I need to do. That's my commitment. And if it's external, I'll find a million reasons and excuses not to do it. Those who focus on the external expect conditions to determine whether they can keep their commitments. I was fully committed to taking the exam and the classes, but then goddamn COVID hit. That has nothing to do with it. People who base their actions on the internal usually focus on their choices. My choice now, given that there's COVID, how do I get my exam done? Right, so two completely two different ways of looking at it. I can do it because of something or because something happened, what are my choices? And I'm going to pick one of them and figure it out. Even, even in your career, hey, I, the sellers are not calling me back. The buyers are not calling me back. Um, the leads are not materializing. I don't have time to do open houses. It's raining today. I have too busy, I have, I'm too busy. I'm tired. Life is busy. I don't have a car to get to my appointment. You can come up with a million, million reasons. Every single action of yours can be probably not be done because of a reason that you may have in the past or in your mind because you are making excuses at that time. But internally, if you really want to get things done, you will figure out a way. You can even sing while you're having COVID at home to do lead generation. Uh, Dwight is on the phone listening because he cares and wants to continue getting better. It doesn't matter where he is. He's found out a way to maximize to the best potential that he can given the circumstances. That's an internal choice. Your choices are the only thing you truly control. You cannot control your circumstances, nor can you control others. By focusing on your choices and then making them with integrity, you control your commitment. And that is what often separates success from failure. I, you, you must have heard me say this a million times. I get asked by so many agents all the time, can you please sit down with me and talk to me about how is your mindset? How do you, how do you run the businesses? How did you achieve what you have achieved or whatever, whatever that means? And I always say, I teach a class. Why don't you come? Then I have the same people who really have valued my time to show up. But then others want that to happen at their time because there's a reason for them not to be here today. But they want to hear the same thing again on a, at a, on a, uh, in a coffee shop over a cup of coffee. The exact same thing but they won't take out the time and do it because it's the difference between the external and internal choices. That's what sets people apart. Do what's right even when you don't feel like it. If you do what you should only when you really feel like it, you won't keep your commitments consistently. So if you do what you should do only when you really feel like it, you won't keep your commitments. When you're interested in something, you do it only when it's convenient. When you're committed to something, you accept no excuses, only results. Huge difference. Is this a hobby or is this a business? 
do uh, am I going to go home and provide the best to my family, or I'm going to try to do what I can given when I go to work today? Failure is not an option. That's when you figure out I'm fully, fully committed to this business. Or I'm just going to give it a shot because I have a full-time job. And if I can make money here, great. If not, it's okay. I tried. That's not a real commitment. And, and you don't have to leave your job, if you have one, to be a fully committed agent as well. You can be dual career. Questions so far? Any thoughts so far? Graf, you said when you started, you were a dual, you had a different career as well, full-time? Full-time. I, had a, I was a computer science network administrator in a company. And then I got my license. And then every week and every weekend, uh, that's what I did. And so you primarily focused on like open houses? Like how I'm, I can't imagine, especially having a family, like how you managed your time, but. Oh, oh, open houses every weekend. And, you know, when, when, when friends said we want to go out for brunch, and uh, uh, we, I said, uh, Saturday or Sunday. And they said, Sunday sounds better. I said, great. I told my wife, Saturday, I'm doing open house. And if they said, you want to go out for drinks? Sure. What time? Five o'clock. Great. I'll schedule my showings before five. It's just about time management. I need to have my personal life, but that, you know, but they have been joined times when my wife said, you want to go to the mall? I can't because you talked about going for a drink in the evening at five o'clock with friends. So I can't do both. Why don't you go to the mall and I'll see you for a drink later. But then there are sacrifices you have to make. Uh, but if I want to be a real good agent, you have to commit to yourself. I've had so many times my, my, my wife was standing outside and I told her, hey, I'm doing open house from 12 to two, pick me up at two and we'll go to the house because of, you know, we'll be 30 minutes late because they wanted us to be the house for, some, you know, something in the afternoon at two, but it was 30 minutes away. And she comes and stands outside and there are clients at the open house. Now it's 2.15, now it's 2.20, and it's 2.30. It, it is what it is. And then, you know, you, you, can, you, you can argue, you can be, you know, she has been upset with me. She has left me behind uh, at times. And there's, there is a commitment that you've got to make. I cannot just leave an open house. And if I commit to an open house, I'm not quitting. A commitment is a commitment. So there, there have been so many times, Kate, that uh, it's, it's just been challenging. It's not easy. Uh, you know, and then all of a sudden, somebody will say, hey, uh, uh, things happen, right? You know, plans get made. Somebody's going to the beach. You want to go tomorrow morning? I can't. I have three showings. So it, I, didn't have that I didn't have that much leverage at that time. Uh, I, I was the one who was doing majority of the work. Um, and I was starting out. And every dollar meant to me at that time. So I could not, didn't want to give one of my buyers away because I only had three buyers. So I wanted to just commit to doing it. So it was, it was not easy, but um, you do what you have to do. So if you go with that attitude, it, it's, and I look at this point now and people say, you know, uh, but you know, it's, it's challenging today because of uh, my, my personal life or I have a child and we all have instances, you know, uh, if, if you ask someone who never got hurt in their lives, a child who never fell on the floor, and then they fell and scraped their knee, and you ask them on a scale of one to 10, how, how, how bad is it? They're going to say 10. It's the worst pain they ever received. And then somebody who just had their uh, finger cut by mistake, and you said from one to 10, what is the, what is the biggest pain? They'll say 10. It's never had that mistake. Somebody probably who fell in, God forbid, had an accident or something different, if you ask them from one to 10, how, how much is the pain? They'll say 10 because they never experienced the pain. So it's relative. Everybody's, everybody's, uh, everybody's responsibilities are relative to what they're used to and they're handling and how they're figuring out. Just because somebody says, I have two kids, my pain is more than you because you have no kids. That's not true. You know, your obligations and responsibilities might be different. But that given, given that, I have friends who have three kids and they're still doing fantastic. And the people who are single... And they don't have time to do open houses. So, so, so what is it, three kids or is the commitment? So that's what we need to focus on. That was the idea of what a commitment is, that you've got to commit. And we put a commitment very easily. I'll commit because I feel like I should be doing it. 
I'll commit to it when I feel like doing it. And if you really, really focused on long-term success, then what you do today is going to show up tomorrow. And if you keep doing it every day, there's no reason why success won't be at your doors at some point when it keeps adding up. But you can't, you can't expect to skip it. Finances. We will sacrifice today so that we can have options tomorrow. Financial freedom is a mental, emotional, and educational process. Recognize your season of life. Learn, earn, or return. Where are you at today? So today, in your real estate career, if you're newly licensed, you're probably more in the learning phase and somewhat in the earning phase. You have not given back yet because you're not at that level yet. I am teaching a class because I'm somewhere in the return phase as well. I can give back to people who are now in the learning phase. And then there are other things in career that you might be able to give back to society and community and, and give back their donations and charity. Then there are different parts of their financial career. But you got to realize where you are. When people say, look at that person. He's doing $8 million in transactions and I haven't done any. My, I'm just not a good agent. That may not be true. You just started a little bit behind them in this real estate career and you are in the learning phase. Because when they were in the learning phase, they also went through exactly what you did. I, I got my license in 2005. In 2008, I probably had only two rentals under my belt. For three years, I sold one or two homes and three rentals. I was a dual career agent. I was doing it. I just didn't do much. But I kept doing it over a period of time. And then came up, came up a moment of my life where I said, I've learned so much then I can take a leap of faith because I think I understand the process. Now I can go ahead and be comfortable and confident with people around me to ask them for business. And if they say, how's the market? I have built my platform and my, and my marketing and my uh, listing agreements and listing presentation where I, can, I feel I can own the right of having their business. So learn, recognizing you shouldn't take shortcuts to financial gain and miss the big picture of your life. Owning is try to take care of your family and prepare for your future. And the return is a phase of giving back to others. So don't take shortcuts in your learning phase. Owning will help you take care of your family and prepare for the future. And then you go into the return phase later. Reduce your debt. Stop incurring debt. If you don't, and this, is just, this, is, this is not a real estate talk, but if you, if you can't afford it and you put yourself in debt, and you get financially stressed out, then every action of your sale is going to reflect your need to close the transaction. That's when you become a pushy salesperson because it's so desperate to make a sale, I need to pay my bills. Then it's not about helping them. Then it's not about getting the best out of the transaction. It's not about thinking the best for the client. It's more for, I need to close this transaction to pay my bills. It will show up in your actions. Track your cash plan for the future, and don't expect instant miracles. And if you really have, this, I don't think it applies to us, but if people who have real financial issues need to seek professional help. Put your financial formula into place. The difference between the rich and the poor is the rich invest their money and spend what's left because they budget it properly and it makes us feel that they're able to achieve what they want as well as invest their money. While the poor spend their money and invest what's left. And we're not talking in a, in a general term of you know, somebody who's not making bare minimum and then we're calling them poor. It's not the case. We're saying there are a lot of people who make a lot of money, but they'll spend the money because they have, want to have a lifestyle without investing for the future. So be very careful. If, if whatever money you make, that's what's going to define how you grow money or are you going to just spend it now and not have anything to less to invest. You make money in real estate to pay your expenses and you build wealth by investing and growing your portfolios. That's what you're doing for many of the people around you. And if you're not doing it for yourself, who's to be blamed that you're helping other people build their wealth, but you're not building your own. You've got to be able to do that for yourself. Failing to plan is like planning to fail. I think it's a pretty cool sentence. 
If you don't plan, you're basically planning to fail. Be a good earner. Work ethic is more about desire than knowledge. It comes from within. So what, what do you mean by good honor? You could be, you need to be the best you ever can be. Right? So given, given what your knowledge and experience and opportunities are, you've got to bring in your work ethic to maximize from this. What often puts out the fires of desire is the belief that the work is too great for the return. So think about it. What often puts out the fires of desire is the belief that the work is too great for the return. I know that open houses work. I know prospecting works. And I know lead generation works. But being on the beach with my friends on a Saturday and Sunday because it's summer is way more important for me than doing what I'm supposed to do. If people start believing in it, then they will not do open houses. They'll come up with those external factors to reduce their commitment. It's all interrelated. So if, if, but, but if people believe that the returns are going to be much, much more greater than the cost that I'm paying for it, then you end up doing it, right? So you, get, you, you invest your money for a better ROI. But if you think there's no ROI on it, why would you invest your money? But that's in the belief system that people have because the, the act of working hard with your work ethic cannot be measured on paper. It can only be measured in actions. Be grateful every day. One of the most important things you can do for yourself is keep your perspective and be thankful for whatever you have. Don't compare yourself to others. That's a big mistake people do in real estate as well. Look at their business. Look at their listing. Look at how happy they are at their vacations. Or they're able to do that without doing open houses. Or they don't, they, they don't do prospecting. You just don't know where they are in their lives and their careers and what phase they are in, do not compare yourself to others. You have to go through the path. You have to pay your dues. You cannot take shortcuts. And if you just follow those things, everyone went through them to be successful. You cannot find a cheat sheet to skip hard work. Most of the times, if and when it happens or knocks on your door, it's the worst thing that happened to you. I have, a, I have an agent in my team a long time ago where his first transaction when he came to the business was, because uh, he made $50,000, million investment property, first transaction. Uh, he got into business and one of his friends called him and said, can you help me find an investment property? And there was another agent um, in our team who, who said, you know, we have, we have investment properties available. And uh, he presented that property to them uh, and, uh, and, the, and the client ended up buying it. And I told him, I said, I'm, the, this is the, I'm, the, I'm happiest for you that this transaction happened for you. I'm so sad your first transaction was a $2 million transaction. And he said, I don't understand. I said, that I'm just really so sad because you think it's going to come this easy again. This is not how easy it is that somebody told you wants to buy a $2 million property. You ask your team members, once the person send you a link, you forward that link and the person put an offer together. I said, this is not how real estate is. And I hope you learn from this that this is not how real estate works. Um, six years into the business, I don't think he made over $50,000 a year. Just never did. Did not, did not want to prospect because he, he was looking for the shortcut every single time in every action. There, when, when you were forced to do open houses, he always had an issue not doing open houses. And if he showed up to do open house, he was 30 minutes late. But if he was on time, he didn't want to put the signs outside. But if he put the signs outside, he didn't want to follow the people who made the sheet. But if he didn't want to follow the people with the sheet, he didn't want to have a, a, a list of properties available for them to show later on. He always had a reason because this is not what he wanted to do. He wanted to find that buyer who, who look at the investment property. So he said, I'm, I'm not, he left the business and said, I'm going to focus purely on investment properties to sell to clients. And I don't know his finances at this point, but I don't see his name around. But I see him around. I just don't see him doing deals. So, I, so that's, you have to be careful, you know, uh, that it's, 
it, you have to pay the dues to loan because if somebody else asks you the questions and you don't have 30 transactions under your belt, how can you make that? How can you make, talk from experience? Anyways, give as much as you can. Money is another pair of hands to heal and feed and bless the desperate families of the earth. Money is my other self. Money can go where I do not have time to go, where I do not have a passport to go. My money can go in my place and heal and bless and feed and help. It is, people are very giving deep down inside. Everyone wants to help out. But how can you help somebody else when you are the most, dis, di, more, di, more dire help, more dire need of help? You got to be able to be successful to make enough money, then give to other people. You'll always hear this statement from people say, well, I just am not motivated by money. Okay, great. But you can, if you had money, you could donate to somebody else who else is in need. Because if you are so good in what you do, then you should be able to make enough money. And if you don't need that money, give it to other people. But if you don't know how to make that much money, then don't say, I'm not in need of money. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not fascinated by money. It's basically you cannot make that much money. So then let's talk about how do you make that money. And you can give it away. Nobody's asking you to keep it. So people always say, and that's another excuse to say, I don't, I'm not motivated. By money. You, don't have to, you don't have to step on other people to make money. That's not called motivation for money. Motivation for money is that I have a better use of the money, either for myself, my family, people around me. I'm going to help people ed educate around me, give it to charity, help people eat and get dressed and go to school. There's so many other ways of doing it. So, not so. Any thoughts on finances so far? Any comments? If three people. It's just nice to talk about them. And like, it, again, this, all these classes make me feel like, oh, it's common sense, but we don't really sit down and think of it. Like give yourself time to really focus on that. Right. Absolutely. That's so true. Most of the things that we talk about is just common sense. And we know it. It's just some, sometimes you need a reminder. And I, and I, and I have... Always, I bring the exercise portion a lot in my life as an example. I'm 42 now. For the last 39 years, I did not work out. I just started working on the last three years. Until 39, I had a reason. I was in college, too busy, too many jobs, too many classes, got married, too many obligations, had to make money, traveling, friends, blah, blah, blah. And then I got a job and then I was dual careered. And then I was doing two jobs and something else on the weekend and I'm compromising and cycling. I just never worked. I always had a reason. I always had a very good reason that I believed in, that it was genuine, that if somebody else was in my shoes, they will understand. Otherwise, you won't. And then when I started working, I've had more businesses, more responsibilities, and I still work out. So it's, it's, all, it's so challenging. And, and then till the time, I, it was, to me, it was common sense that... I had to work out. I knew I had to work out. I just didn't do it. But then something happened and somebody told me till I had an accountability partner who shows up every shows up in the morning and said, let's go jogging. I wouldn't do it. Even now I need someone to push me to work out. Otherwise I won't do it. But since I know I won't do it, it's a recognition from my side. Then I hired a trainer. And I got, okay, if I'm not going to get up and go, but I know I need to do that, then I'm just going to hold... Just pay someone if I can't find someone. But I need to do it. So you could also figure out in your life and be accepting to, I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at. And the things that I'm good at, I'm going to continue doing them better and better. And the things that I'm not good at, I'm going to work harder to make sure that I accomplish them as well. Not that I'm going to leave them alone. Ava, you want to say something? I'm good. <laughs> okay. All right, relationships. Making the decision to initiate and invest in solid relationships daily. Our business is a contact sport. You cannot, you cannot be a secret agent sitting at home and not working on relationships with clients. It just doesn't work. Relationships end too soon because people stop putting in the same effort to keep you as they did to win you. 
bless you, Eva. You have to think about, you know how, you know how much time people spend for first-time home buyer programs? I will do a happy hour. I will bring people in. Uh, I'll send postcards. I'll reach out to everybody else that I can think of to how can I achieve to get the first-time home buyers in a room so I can help them buy their first home? Who are most of these first-time home buyers? Tenants. How many people say, I want to work with renters? 1% of the real estate agents. So you don't want to work with real estate agents, but everyone wants to work with first-time home buyers. So it's a catch-22 there. And then there's another statement that 89% of the people will work with the first agent they ever worked in the past. So if an agent works with a renter, there is 89% possibility that they will use you to buy a home. So most people say, I don't want to work with a renter because I will take my chances of being the 11% to work with a first-time home buyer. And then the people who get that opportunity are able to make a living. And then 90% of people who can't say this business sucks. And you know the number one reason why people leave? The business? Eva, what do you think? Number one reason people leave real estate business. Or being an agent, I should say. Take a shot at it. I'm still, I'm still hoping, I, I don't know if you heard me, Ava, I was trying to see if you can take a shot at it. Why do people leave this business as real estate agents? Number one reason. Not making money. That's part of it, true. Not being able to pay the dues. 100 bucks a month and the GPAR and MLS fees. Number one reason we believe. And if you think about it, 100 bucks a month is 1200 bucks a year. 500 bucks is for the, for the GPAR and then another three, 400 bucks for MLS, $2,000. So they spend 75 hours of their life, $500 to get a license, told everybody in their lives they became an agent, got their business cards, everything is done. They spent so much time and energy because that was a career of their life that they wanted to get in, into business for themselves. And for $2,000 a year, they quit the business. So they couldn't make $2,000. It's one transaction. They could not make $2,000 because they were waiting for that one transaction all year round. In my mind, if you did one rental a month, you make $6,000. That's 500 bucks a month. After paying your broker fees, transaction fees, your team splits, other cooperating broker, we live in a city where there's so many eds and meds that there's so much rentals. It's over 15,000 rentals available. Can, you can't rent six, 12, one a month. So, pe so people are trying to build relationships at the time when they feel they want to win you. The real relationship starts way, way behind. Place a high value on people, not on the transaction. Learn to understand people. People are insecure give them confidence. People want to feel special, sincerely compliment them. People desire a better tomorrow, show them hope. People need to be understood, listen to them. People are selfish, speak to their needs first. And people want to be associated with success, help them win. So such easy concepts. As a co-listing agent, co-buyer agent, an associate in a team, individual agent, renters, investors, buyers, sellers. This applies to all of them. People want to be friends with agents to help them interact in real estate transactions. They don't need a real estate agent 
just to help them with real estate. Give respect freely, but expect to earn it from others. Give respect freely, but expect to earn it from others. I think there's a word missing there. Give respect freely, but expect... Then actually, I take it back. I understand. Uh, give respect freely, but expect to earn it from others. So your job is to give respect to everyone. But then you have to earn it from others because you can't have it for granted or you can't expect it as an expectation because you'll lead to, to, to just, just frustration if you don't get it back. Every human being deserves to be treated with respect because everyone has value. Even a renter who wants to rent for a thousand bucks might be a college student today, but might buy, might buy a $10 million home in the future because every $10 million buyer today was a student 10 years ago. It's about you keeping the relationship. You don't have to know everyone. Is your business for the next three years or do you want to be in business for life? You have to start someplace. Those are the people who will eventually become your multi-million dollar buyers. But people get, into, do people get a license and say, what do you want to do? I want to do luxury. Okay, that's great. You can do luxury, but what are you willing to do for luxury? Do you have clients that you know? Do you have relationships that you know? No, I just want to sell million dollar homes because it's so cool. And I can make a lot of money. Why sell 10 homes when I can sell one? It's the wrong way of getting into the business. That doesn't mean you can't demand respect in return. You must earn it. Commit yourself to adding value to others. Carve your name on hearts and not on marble. When I, when I, read, that, when I read that statement, what reminded me was, People get postcards and bombarded with the real estate agents all the time. Everyone's friend, cousin, neighbor, mom, dad, brother, somebody or the other is a real estate agent. Everyone knows a real estate agent. But if you make an impact on them as a person, now that matters more than the postcards that they're getting in the mail. Some people approach every interaction with others as a transaction. They are willing to add value, but only if they expect to receive value in return. If you want to make relationships a priority, you must check your motives to be sure you're not trying to manipulate others for your own gain. That will show in your actions. And people run fastest away from those people. A lot of times we take relationships for granted. We don't always give them the attention they deserve or require. But good relationships require a lot of effort. Every day, I make the conscious effort to deposit goodwill into my relationships with others. Put others first. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Don't carry emotional baggage. That person did not use me to buy their first home. Why should I care about helping them? They knew I was in the business. They still didn't want to work with me. Now they want me to recommend a painter to them. Go screw yourself. Don't carry that emotional baggage. You don't know every, every reason why they did it. And they may just say, and you know the number one reason why people don't use their friends and family? What do you think, Kate? What is the number one reason why people don't use their friends and family? Um, do they just not want them in their business, like financially? True. That true as well. That true as well. So for a newer agent, the number one reason people say, I always ask for referrals from friends and family, right? The reason why people don't work with newer agents, they know you too well. They know what you don't know. I'm looking to invest half a million dollars of my most hard-earned money. It's the biggest investment of my life. I love you to death, my friend but I know you just got a license last week and you've never been a great kid. I cannot rely on you because I've seen you in action and other things. But I'm sure you're going to be a great agent one day, not today. And when it's an experienced agent, it is a lot of our finances. So you know what? I, I tell any of my friends, if I ever talk to them and I ever felt that they were the kind of people, I will say, yeah, the interesting part about my business is I only help people buy real estate. I have nothing to do with the finances. That is between you and the lender more than happy to recommend one, but you don't have to use a person. Use your own personal bank so your financial stays with you. If I know that's the reason, why would I not 
counter argue against it today and let them think over it when they're ready to buy something. But if I tell them soon, then whenever they are ready to buy, they never have to have this objection handling. They never have to think, oh my God, how would Gaurav feel if I told him I don't want to use him or I use somebody else? Because what I really didn't want him to see how much I make. Don't have to use me. I don't want to see it. Don't care. Give time to your most valuable relationships. Serve others gladly. Express love and appreciation often. That is all from your database, how you're going to stay in touch with them. So recap, our commitment, do what is right even when you don't feel like it. Finances, sacrifice today so you have options tomorrow. And relationships, make the decision to initiate and invest in a solid relationship daily. That's the last one I had. So some thoughts on relationships. I know that recently I've been, um, I think it's that emotional baggage that you, you, some, you know you shouldn't carry, but working with renters. And I, I do really think that, you know, one day, that, you know, they have to buy a home. They still have to live somewhere, whether they continue renting or whatever. So I try to, you know, nurture those relationships. And I've gotten to a point where, you know, I congratulate them if they find a place, even if I didn't help them find it, it's Zillow, whatever. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's great. Well, one, it is great because then I don't have to keep showing them things and just like wasting time. But I, I think it's just putting that into perspective and actually consciously thinking relationship wise, not a, oh, like when you want to buy or sell, I'm going to use you. But generally, like, you know, the reason we're in this business, I'm rambling, but you know what I'm trying to say. I think, sure. you know, we want to help people and just being genuine and normal with them. I think we'll see they'll trust us as people, which hopefully will lead them trusting us in transactions. So why do people, why do people go through Zillow or other places directly and not use you? Um, I mean, they'll look at my listings, but then they'll say, oh, can you show me this place? And you know how a lot of the landlords don't accept outside agents. So I'll say, oh, unfortunately you have to schedule. I mean, I'll call whoever that number is on Zillow. Um, but and then I'm just like, I'm here if you want me to read your lease before you sign it and mm -hmm. do all that's that. That's great. But I think that's great. Nature of our business. If you're, if you're in the jewelry business, you go to Jewelers Row and somebody wants to buy a $10,000 watch. Mm -hmm. They go to the first place and they say, do you carry a Rolex? And you say, I'm the best reseller for Rolex. We sold a million Rolex more than anybody else in the country with the best, best amount of designs and inventory for Rolex. Show me. Teach me. Educate me. What does this mean? How does it work? What do I have to sign? What is the warranty? You ask every single thing and they say it's worth 10900 And they say, you know what? Let me think about it. Then they leave. Then they go to the next door and say, do you have Rolex number DVR1350 in gold at 44 millimeter width? You already, you already, showed, you already told them all those things. And the guy says, yeah, because by that time, that person realizes you've been there somewhere else. You've done your research. I said, how much is it? It's like regular price is 10,900, I'll give you 10,500. Now the person has a choice to make. Do I go back to the person who helped me and educated me completely? Or do I just buy it from here? It's the same thing. I have nothing to lose, I say 400 bucks many of them will actually end up buying there. Mm -hmm. But you cannot be saddened by that because it's a Murphy's law. Tomorrow, somebody's going to go to that person and ask him for a whole Rolex and everything else and will come to you. And if you're smart enough to recognize the opportunity, you will say, aha, it seems like you wasted somebody's two hours. I will sell you for 10500 and you make the money. Similarly, people go and look at a million places and then they call you to show them X, Y, and Z and then you'll just get hit a jackpot because you are that one person somebody else has been showing them for six months. And then they never followed up and when they were ready to buy something or rent something, they came to you. So don't be disheartened by what you went through because we all go through that ourselves. 
And when you get somebody and you say, hey, this was amazing. They called me. They wanted to see one property and they rented it. Best deal. Just don't know that they wasted five other agents' times, 10, 10 hours each. It wasn't the easiest deal. You just got the Murphy's Law luck. Mm-hmm. So it's nature of the game. So don't be disheartened because every time. So if, if you capture 30, 40% capture ratio and the one that you lose, that means you're more closer to the three or four that is left out of the 10 average. So that's, that's how the business works. And, if you, and I've also seen that if you tell people in advance, I know you're looking on Z- every looks on Zillow. There's no hiding about it. I think it's about transparency. And so listen, you, you can, you don't pay, first of all, you don't pay us in Pennsylvania. We get paid from landlord and sellers. So my services to you are for free and I'm here to assist you and I don't get paid till you actually sign the document. So it's like hiring an accountant or attorney or or. Uh, uh, an architect for free to work for you and you on, we only get paid not by the hours but only at for results it's the best professional business that you could hire us for and then if you we all share the same database if you see and think this is like new york and every agent is holding some special deals under the belt that's not true we all share the same database the mls rules within 24 hours we have to put everything on mls that we get a listing for so now the question comes to be who's going to be able to show you the fastest and who has the maximum knowledge and who has your best interest in mind. So he, I am willing to put in 100% of my effort and commit to helping you find the best place for the best price. However, if you did find something on Zillow or other places, instead of calling them directly and you felt comfortable with me because of my hard work and with, with our relationship, are you okay just having me show those places to you? So I only make money when I'm working with clients and then they close on properties. You think the person will look at your face and say, no? And if they say yes, how many people will do things that they haven't said? Worth? I, I don't know how to phrase that. that. Going back to the same example, if you said to that person who was leaving the store and said, listen, I might have a little room to negotiate. If you are so sure and committed to buying, and you did shop around outside and you found a better price because I educated and so much, spent so much time for you. Let me know what price and if I can beat it, I'll beat it. Now you think when the person goes and says 10500 the person's thinking, you know, I could just go back because I had a conversation with that lady. She was very nice, who spent two hours with me. And if you can give me for 10500 I don't mind walking back and just getting from her. It's just that they never asked. Same thing for renters. If you don't ask, they don't know how you would feel. And you could say there are sometimes some landlords. And if you find something that there is a landlord who's not willing to pay the commission, I am still okay. What hurts me more is if you ghost me. I value my friendship. And today, if I didn't make money on you, it doesn't mean my relationship with you ends. You will have friends you recommend me. You'll have, you will buy it in the future. And I want to be your real estate agent of choice for life. So if you did find something, I will still help you walk through them. Just not helping them walk through them, explaining to them that I'm okay with these things. You think at that point they will not mind? I assure you, even if they call you back, they'll say, I still want to give you a $100 gift card for a restaurant. You lost them anyways. Might as well have a drink with them and have lunch with them and put them in your database and say, and you, can you imagine how many friends are they going to go and say this to? So it's the way that we do our expectations. We think people should know. They don't know. And even if they know, it's okay for them in their minds, no harm done. Because you didn't express to them how emotionally hurt you would be if that happened or what your expectation was. So take the time and set those things. You will see different results. That's so true, Graf. That was just like mind blowing, even though again, it's like, you just don't think to take those extra steps to really let them know it's not that deep. Don't ghost me. <laughs> right. And uh, the, the key to, to uh, any negotiating in life is if you know what the challenges are or the, or the uh, objection is going to be, getting them out of the way right now. Just, just say it out loud. I know you must be thinking you have to share your finances with me. You don't have to. 
I know you're thinking that you'll have to be married to me if I start showing one property, I'm going to make you sign an agreement. Maybe you don't. Or I'm only committed, I will only ask you to sign anything for the property that I've shown to you so I'm protected to get paid from the other side. I'm setting the expectation. So just say it out loud. And, if so, and, and, and I never be shy to make money. You think somebody goes to an employer and says, I'll submit my resume, but I'm very shy. Are you going to actually pay me? They demand it. I am so good in what I do. So if you want me to do these things in your job, I'm going to demand this much money. So why are we afraid? Is it because we're trying to be the number one agent and we don't know our shit? Then sure, if a, uh, if, if a, if a resident student goes and apply for a surgeon's job, sure, he's going to be nervous because they don't have the experience and knowledge. But if you do, uh, they'll demand it. I will, I'm only willing to work with you if I can get this from you as well. And if I don't have your commitment, why am I wasting my time? At least a verbal commitment if you're not giving me in writing. So just ask them, so is this, are you comfortable with, are you committed to providing the same loyalty back to me as much as I'm providing to you? It's 3.56, four more minutes. Feel free to ask me any question you want, any thoughts, any takeaways, as the same KW, any ahas? All good. <laughs> I can listen to you talk all day, Graf. I appreciate it. <laughs> sure. Eva, any questions on your side? Yeah, I, I have a question in my mind, and sure. uh, it's probably not relevant, but um, I have a friend who recently bought an Airbnb investment property, and he knew that I got my uh, license, and he asked me to show him properties, even though he's not prepared to buy another one. He just want to see properties and know the market. And uh, do I spend time with him? Like, I know if he wants to buy, he definitely come to me. But um, do I want to spend like maybe one year to show him properties without him closing a deal? Answer is, <laughs> answer is 110%. Yes. <laughs> answer is 110%. But because, first of all, it's, we don't work with people who are ready to buy tomorrow. We just talked about it. It's not a transaction. It's a relationship. Mm -hmm. So if he wants to look at properties, that means he's spending his valuable time. So do I ever say, when somebody opens a jewelry shop, to say, are you buying today? Then the only time I'm going to show you the, 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 uh, the necklace. If you're just shopping for your wife for anniversary, which is four months from now, you're looking for Christmas, it's October, get out of my way, come back. And it's December. No, I'm here to serve. I'm, I'm here to help you. I'm here to educate you. You mm -hmm. never know. People may buy something. He may buy something which is a great value that comes on his way. He may not be ready today, but then you are in a position to set the expectation in the future, asking him the right to be his exclusive agent because you spend so much time with him. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you have no right of asking him to be his exclusive agent. Because he's going to go and see this place with somebody else. And at that point, that person should have the right of asking him to represent himself. So you need to spend the time, educate yourself as well, because you may not be as experienced as what he might be. So if he added you, because he has done more Airbnbs than you, I'm just assuming it. Mm -hmm. But if that's the case, it's a great time for you to educate yourself. And he may get you so educated you should be asking him the right questions of how he analyzes each property that you can become an Airbnb expert for everybody else that calls you. That's your moment of to shine. So that showing of a property is an education for free. You have a mentor next to you who can teach you. Instead of, you have, you, you, instead of thinking that he's wasting your time, he's giving you his time. He's done this business before. Mm -hmm. sit down with him, ask him, how do you analyze it? How do you make money? What is the ROI? Is there an Excel sheet? Can you teach me the Excel sheet? Give me the Excel sheet so I can also look for properties for you and see if this model works for you. I can give it to you and we don't have to see properties every single time. And I love doing this thing with you. I hope 
your ask committed to me in the future whenever you're ready to buy. Take that verbal commitment. Then you probably have a right of doing business with him for life. The answer is yes, for those reasons that I just said. <laughs> you know, when somebody buys a home, what is the average, what is the average number of years uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in this country uh, for a person to own a home? How long does a person live in the same house? For how long? Average. Five to seven years. Seven to eight years. So every seven years to eight years, some, the person moves, average. Some people move two to three years, some people move for 14 years, you know, but it's an average of seven to eight years. You know, when they start thinking of the next home? The day after they move in. The day after they move in. That is so correct. Mm -hmm. The day after they move in, they start thinking of the next home. This home doesn't have enough closet space. Wish there was a swimming pool. This is too far away from my job. That would that would I don't really like. In our next home, I'll make sure that we have the same granite. Our kids will outgrow the space in five years. We'll have to run over to the kitchen next time. One car doesn't squeeze in, and so on, because they start comparing already. It's the next day. So if you are in a relationship with them for seven years, you're guaranteed that buyer. How many people can you stay in touch with them for seven years? How fast can you build your database and automate it to stay in touch with them for seven years? That's how business, that's how big your business will be in seven years. If you go behind all those people after seven years, you may lose the battle to people who've been in touch with them for seven years. Because you're only part of that 11% in the end, the 89% is going to go away. Cool, guys. It's 402. Thanks for being with me. Thank, I appreciate you. And uh, anything I can do to help you, please, my email is there as well. Shoot me a quick email. I'm happy to assist. Thank you so much, Rob. A pleasure like always. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Bye, guys. Bye.